Today's episode of Revive Our Hearts is sponsored in part by members of our monthly partner team. And we just want you to know how much your support means to us. Thank you so much for your support. God's love for us sometimes brings pain. Nancy DeMoss Walgamu says, If you are a child of God, when God's discipline comes into your life, it is not punitive. He does not intend to destroy you. His goal for chastening is to restore you, restorative, chastening, to make us more holy. Welcome to the Revive Our Hearts podcast with Nancy DeMoss Walgamuth, author of Facing Our Fears, Finding Him Faithful. For June 27, 2022, I'm Dana Gresh. When bad things come into your life, do you ever find yourself thinking, God must be angry, out to get you? Today, in this summer of surrender here on Revive Our Hearts, we'll find out if that view is accurate as Nancy continues a study called Habakkuk, Moving from Fear to Faith. While we're in the midst of grappling with some tough issues, along with Habakkuk, the prophet in the Old Testament, we looked around him and he said, God, there are so many things going on among your people that I'm really concerned about. And what really troubles me, Habakkuk says to God, is that it doesn't seem like you're doing anything about it. I'm praying, I'm crying out to you, but you don't seem to be active. You seem passive. And God said, wait a minute, Habakkuk, I've been listening. And in fact, I am doing a work in your days. I want you to look. I want you to see, open your eyes, and you're going to see that I am at work. But when I tell you what it is that I'm doing, you may not believe it. And in the last session, we saw God's description of the Chaldeans, the Babylonians is another name for the Chaldeans, this fierce, terroristic group of violent, vicious, ruthless people that God said he was raising up as the answer to Habakkuk's prayers. God says these Babylonians, these Chaldeans, they're going to take over the world. They're going to take over Judah, and they are going to be my instruments to chasten my people. Now, that was not the answer Habakkuk was praying. And after our last session, Kendra came up to me and she uh, reminded me that so many people are afraid to pray because of fear for how God is going to answer their prayers. Kendra, why don't you just share what you shared with me? Because I thought it was such a good observation. Well, um, just in response that I've had so many people say to me, be careful what you pray for. And my response to that is just heartache because we don't need to be careful about what we pray for. God has perfect love for us. Perfect love casts out all fear. We don't need to be afraid of what God is going to do in the life of the people that we love. We are free to pray that God will do whatever he needs to do. He may raise up Chaldeans in our loved ones' lives. But he has a perfect love for us. He is holy. He's not going to be doing things, um, having the same kind of motives that we might have. So we can trust in God. Thanks, Kendra. And I think Kendra has tapped into something there that probably every mother has felt at times. If I pray for God's will to be done in my children's lives, if I pray for my children to come to repentance and to faith, or for my husband or somebody else I love, what might it take? What might God do? And there's sometimes this fear, this holding back on God. And we're going to see in Habakkuk that the person who believes God does not have to be afraid. You can not have to draw back in fear if you trust that God is good and God is great and God is sovereign and God is wise and God loves your loved ones more than you could. He knows exactly what is needed in their lives. So if it is the Chaldeans that he raises up to answer your prayers... You don't have to be afraid of that. Now, we're going to see that Habakkuk does tremble. It doesn't mean it's going to be easy, but it means your feet will be solidly planted. You can have confidence in the Lord, even as the Chaldeans are being raised up. We'll dive back into Habakkuk with Nancy in a moment here on Revive Our Hearts, but I want to mention something here. That fear of surrendering to the Lord's will is not uncommon. And it's something Nancy's written about in a booklet called Facing Our Fears. The subtitle is Finding Him Faithful. And all this month, we're considering this question. What if the key to facing your fears is found in one simple word? Surrender. 
Nancy explores the implications of that in her booklet. And this month, we'll send you a copy of Facing Our Fears when you contact Revive Our Hearts with a donation of any amount. It's just our way of thanking you. Stay tuned, and I'll tell you how you can get in touch with us. But now, let's continue with Nancy. Now, at this point in our account in Habakkuk chapter 1, Habakkuk is deeply disturbed by God's response. God has said, I'm raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation. This was not at all the answer to prayer that he was expecting or hoping for. And it's incomprehensible to Habakkuk that God would use people as wicked as the Chaldeans to deal with the sin among God's people. So God's response to Habakkuk's questions has in fact raised more problems than it solved. Now we said early on that Habakkuk means wrestler one who wrestles. He's wrestling with these questions and he's wrestling with God, trying to comprehend in God's inscrutable wisdom, what is going on here and how could God do this? So in verse 12 of Habakkuk chapter one, Habakkuk responds to God. God has just said, I'm raising up the Chaldeans. And Habakkuk says in verse 12, are you not from everlasting And I just imagine that after God finished this whole big long description of what the Chaldeans were like, it was this pregnant pause. And Habakkuk just, it's like his breath is taken away. And then he says, are you not from everlasting? Oh Lord, my God, my Holy One, we shall not die. So what does Habakkuk do? He goes back to the things he knows to be true. When his whole world is shaken here and God gives him this astounding answer, God had said, when you see this, when you hear about this work I'm doing, you will not believe it. And Habakkuk's going, you're right about that one. I mean, my breath is taken away here. How can it be that God would raise up these terrorists to come and take over our nation? And all of a sudden, he's not as concerned now about the sin of his people as he had been originally, now he's really concerned about the devastation that's going to happen to them. So in this whirlwind, in this swirling emotions and thoughts, Habakkuk goes to the things he knows. What is certain? Okay, first of all, the thing is certain is the character of God. Are you not from everlasting? O Lord, my God, my Holy One, verse 12. What is Habakkuk saying? God, I know you. You are everlasting. That's one thing I'm sure of. You are immutable is the implication there. You don't change. You have unchanging character. You're faithful. You keep your promises. And then he says, you're the Lord. That means the sovereign Lord. And he says, you are my holy one. You are fundamentally holy. It's just like he's rehearsing to himself, coaching himself. This is what I know is true about God. That's a good thing for you to do when your head is spinning and you're in confusion about what's going on around you. Go back to the things you know are true. One thing is the character of God. What do you know about God's character? Rehearse it. Tell God what you know. And then the covenant of God. He says, you are my God. We have a covenant relationship. You are a covenant-keeping God. You will keep your covenant with your people. And that's why he says, we shall not die. God, you may discipline us, you may chasten us, but you're not going to destroy us. There's not going to be cataclysmic judgment, final judgment against those who are truly your people. We shall not die. Of this, I'm sure, we're children of the covenant, those who believe in you. So he rehearses the character of God, the covenant of God, and then the choices of God. He rehearses these. He reviews these. He mulls them over. He expresses faith in them. In verse 12, he goes on to say, Oh, Lord, you have ordained them, that's the Chaldeans, as a judgment. And you, O rock, have established them for reproof. So he's processing in his mind what God has just told him. And he's acknowledging what God has just told him. Okay, the Chaldeans are an instrument in God's hands to chasten, to discipline, to reprove his people. You have ordained them as a judgment. You have established them for reproof. This is God's doing. It's like he's repeating back to God what God has just told him. Let me see if I got this straight, God. I'm agreeing with you. I'm acknowledging that what you said is true, that your hand is in this. This is not an accident. You have not fallen asleep. You have not fallen off your throne. You have not abdicated your rule over this world. You have ordained them. He acknowledges God's sovereignty. And he recognizes the need for reproof. 
among God's people for chastening, for discipline. He realizes that God is not going to let his people continue in their sin indefinitely. And isn't that what Habakkuk had been concerned about at the very beginning? God, how can you look at all this and not do anything about it? God said, I am doing something about it. Habakkuk says, oh, yeah, I see what you're doing is you're going to reprove, you're going to discipline, you're going to chasten your people. But keep in mind as you read this passage, and Habakkuk has it right, God's intent is merely to discipline and to chasten his children, not to demolish or destroy them. If you are a child of God, when God's discipline comes into your life, it is not punitive. He does not intend to destroy you. His goal for chastening is to restore you. Restorative, chastening, to make us more holy. That's what Hebrews 12 talks about, the discipline, the chastening of God. He chastened us so that we may be partakers in his holiness. So Habakkuk is identifying with the purposes of God here. Lord, you have ordained them as a judgment. You have established them for reproof, for chastening. We will not die, but you are going to discipline us. And then be reminded that God chooses the means and the method of discipline that he knows is best. And you got to leave that choice with God. Habakkuk would not have chosen for God to use the Chaldeans to chasten the Jews. Oh, maybe to chasten all the other pagan nations. And Lord, I know we need chastening, but I would have chosen a different instrument. And God said, let me choose the instrument. God chooses the means and the method of chastening that he knows is best. And in God's wisdom and in God's providence, in this case, God chose to purify and sanctify his people by means of a nation even more wicked than they. So Habakkuk says, okay, God, I've got this. I know that you're God. I know that you don't change. I know that you keep your covenant. I know that you're chastening your people. And Lord, I don't understand this, but I, I believe it. I see it that you've ordained the Chaldeans as a judgment and you have established them for reproof. This is not an accident. This is not out of your control. But he still doesn't understand. It doesn't seem right that a holy, righteous God would work in this way. So he says in verse 13, I'm going to press into the heart of God a little further. Now, as we said earlier in the series, it's not clear whether he was asking these questions with a clenched fist or with a searching heart. The more I have read and studied the book of Habakkuk, the more I really think it was with a searching heart. That's my sense as I read it. Some commentators disagree with me. But regardless, he's saying to God, verse 13, Lord, Help me understand this. You are of purer eyes than to see evil, and you cannot look at wrong. That's something I've always known about you. You're holy. And Habakkuk has a strong, deep sense of the holiness of God. It's one of the reasons, by the way, I think we don't grapple today more deeply with spiritual issues is because we have so little sense of God's holiness. And so what goes on in the world doesn't bother us a whole lot because we're just inoculated. We're accustomed. Our eyes are used to the dark. Habakkuk had not gotten his eyes used to the dark. He still knew that God was pristine holy. God, you can't look on evil. You cannot look at wrong. Uh, We read this in Psalm chapter 5, where the psalmist says, You are not a God who delights in wickedness. The evil may not dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all evildoers. So Habakkuk says, God, if you're holy, this perplexes me. It doesn't make sense. He's looking for a logical explanation. And he goes on to say in verse 13, If you're so holy, why? There's that why question again. Why do you idly look at traitors? And you're silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he. He started out by saying, Lord, I know that my people aren't righteous. I know they need to change. I know they need to be disciplined. But now you say the instrument of your reproof is going to be these wicked, wicked Chaldeans. I mean, God, we're wicked, but they are wicked, wicked. And how can you stand idly by and be silent when these wicked Chaldeans swallow up those who are more righteous than he. Now, when he started out his complaint in the beginning of the book, he wasn't calling the Jews righteous. But now he's changed his tune a little bit. All of a sudden, compared to the Chaldeans, the Jews look pretty good. 
even though the Jews have destruction and violence and strife and contention and all those things he had named in the first paragraph of the book. But now they're looking pretty good by comparison to the Chaldeans. And so God's behavior in using the Chaldeans to discipline the Jews doesn't seem consistent with what Habakkuk knows about the character and the ways of God. Lord, you're holy. How can you use unholy means? Now, the implication is here, the Jews may be backslidden. Yeah, they have their issues. Yeah, they have their problems. But they are certainly more righteous than the Chaldeans. So we can't accept that God would chasten his people by means of people even more wicked than they. And here's where you wonder if there's not a tinge of self-righteousness that creeps in. I know it does to our hearts. Because the prophet feels that the people of Judah are more righteous than the Chaldeans. I think it's showing that he doesn't realize how seriously God views the sin of his own people. In fact, God's people are even more accountable because they have the law of God. They know God. God has revealed himself to them. And God takes perhaps even more seriously the sin of his people than he does the reprobation and the wickedness of the pagan nations. Now, God takes all sin seriously. But there's something in us that says, God, we may have issues and needs, but I'm not as bad off as the instrument you're using to deal with me. And so you have here a wife who, yes, she knows she's got spiritual needs and she wants God to deal with those needs. And she wants God, you know, God, purify me, make me more like Jesus. I know the things in my life, they're rough edges, they're things that need to be changed. But then she's flabbergasted when God uses a less godly husband as an instrument of her sanctification. God, that doesn't seem right. It doesn't seem fair. And it goes both ways, by the way. I got an email uh, not too long ago from a husband. We have a few men who write to us that revive our hearts. And he was pleading with us to pray for uh, his marriage. Um, He and his wife have been separated, maybe even divorced now, if I remember correctly. And he's just pleading with God to reconcile this marriage. And he wanted us to know that he was serious about this. So he sent this two-page long typed letter listing for us. First, he said, my sins are. And he was pretty honest about his failures and faults in this marriage. And then he said, my wife's sins are. Well, as I looked at the list, and I'm sure this was not intentional, but she had more sins than he did. (laughs) And hers were as bad as his, plus a little worse. And now wives do this too. And I'm not pointing fingers at that husband. I'm just saying, isn't it our tendency to say, okay, I've got issues, but my mate really has issues. So as I read this letter, he was saying, I want to go to counseling. My wife doesn't. I'm willing to deal with our issues. My wife isn't. And it was kind of this comparison thing. And I think coming out of a genuine heart, but it's kind of the way we think. Lord, I have issues, but how can you use somebody who's worse off than I am to be your means of dealing with my life? And as I think about that email, I'm thinking God has brought a Chaldean into his life. A wife who, if, of course, if you could ask her, chances are she would say, here are my few sins and here are his many sins. So it's in the eye of the beholder. But even if he's totally 100% accurate in his assessment, God is wanting to use his maybe more wicked wife than he is as an instrument of bringing him to brokenness and humility and repentance. But it seems topsy-turvy, doesn't it, sometimes that God would work in this way? And so Habakkuk says to God in verse 14, this is just hard for me to understand. Verse 14, you make mankind like the fish of the sea, like crawling things that have no ruler. You have there a picture of just helpless insects and fish swimming around in the sea. And then verse 15, he, and he's speaking here of the Babylonian empire, he brings all of them up with a hook. He drags them out with his net. He gathers them in his dragnet. So he rejoices and is glad. Therefore, he sacrifices to his net and makes offerings to his dragnet. For by them, he, that is the Babylonian empire, empire, lives in luxury, and his food is rich. So here you have these wicked, wicked people who are being used as an instrument of God to chasten God's people, and the wicked, wicked people are getting off scot-free, and in fact, they're getting rich. 
in the process. And we're like these fish swimming around in the ocean or like these helpless little insects crawling around. And here comes the king of the Babylonians. And he throws in his hook and he just pulls us out one after the other. I mean, we are just being slaughtered. And he's getting rich off this game. And in fact, the Babylonians are worshiping themselves because of their prosperity, their military might, they're self-sufficient. They think they need no one and nothing. I mean, they are godless. And Habakkuk is saying, God, this does not make sense that you would use people like this. Verse 17, is he then, that is the Babylonian empire, is he then to keep on emptying his net and mercilessly killing nations forever? There's that how long question again. Lord, is this going to go on forever? Will it go on indefinitely? Is there no end? And have you ever found yourself crying out in the midst of your marriage or your issues with your children or your situation at work, Lord, is there no end to this? I'm getting worse off. They're getting better off. We're going the wrong direction. How long is this going to last? Now, in protesting what seems to Habakkuk to be an unfair, incomprehensible act on God's part, Habakkuk runs the risk of forgetting how very sinful God's people are and how deserving they are of God's discipline because they don't feel so bad next to the Chaldeans. The problem is that Habakkuk's only seeing it from his own perspective. If he could see from God's perspective, he would see what we said a few moments ago, that God's people are even more accountable. In God's eyes, their condition is as serious as that of the Chaldeans. And isn't it easy for us to excuse our own behavior, our own issues? Yeah, we know we have issues. I know I'm not. um, This one letter where the husband was saying what his issues were, the first thing he said, my first sin is pride. And I'm thinking if we could see pride from God's point of view, that's one really, really serious sin. Yeah, your wife has done blah, 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 but you just acknowledged having pride? Do you realize how serious your pride is? Say, Lord, but my husband committed adultery. I'm just proud. The scripture says God stiff arms the proud. God hates pride. It's listed as one of the very worst sins. Adultery isn't on that list in Proverbs chapter 6. But pride is. So we tend to compare ourselves to those who are worse and as a way of escaping our own responsibility and protesting and saying, God, it doesn't seem right that you would use these wicked, wicked people when I'm just just proud. Well, God wants us to see that that pride or whatever it is in our lives is a huge issue and it needs to be dealt with and God knows what instrument it will take to deal with it. So it's at this point that some people become bitter at God. They cut God out of their lives. I've had it. If that's the way God's going to be, if that's the way he's going to act, if that's the kind of instrument he's going to use, I'm not dealing with him. Or they keep acting like they're dealing with God, but just going through the motions. Yeah, I'll keep going to church. I'll keep working hard, keep doing my Christian thing, but I'm not going to stay engaged with a God who acts this way. And that's a pathway a lot of people choose. They draw back instead of pressing forward in faith. Habakkuk finds himself here at a crossroads. He can choose fear and anger, or he can choose faith and hope and surrender. Habakkuk sees that this incomprehensible situation is really an opportunity to get to know God better. And so he says, by faith, I'm going to press on. I don't understand this but I'm going to stay engaged with God. And because he does, we have a chapter three of Habakkuk. We'll get there sooner or later. It'll be a few weeks yet before we actually get to that last incredible paragraph of Habakkuk three, but feel free to go ahead and look at the end of the chapter and look at the end of the story and see the incredible joy that erupts from Habakkuk's heart. You know why? Because he was willing to walk through the process, to stay engaged with God. 
not to get bitter, but to say, I'm going to press on in faith, even when I can't see. So, Lord, I pray that you would help us to press on, to know you, to see you, to explore your ways, to search out your heart, and that we would let you have your way in our lives, whatever that means, whatever that looks like, whatever it takes. Have your way, O oh Lord. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Nancy DeMoss Walgenmuth has been helping us make sense of some difficult passages in Habakkuk. Like she just said, we're going to see that joy erupts in Habakkuk's heart. And if you need some joy to erupt, stay with us as we follow his journey from fear to faith. I mentioned earlier the booklet by Nancy, Facing Our Fears. It's a great way to look your fears in the face and find God faithful. And it all has to do with coming to a place of surrendering to the Lord, just like Habakkuk did. We'll send you a copy of Facing Our Fears as a thank you for your donation of any amount. And if you're giving to Revive Our Hearts for the first time, we also include another booklet compiled by Nancy. It's called 50 Promises to Live By, and it's a great way to meditate on many of the comforting promises God makes to us in His Word. Just let us know this is your first time making a donation to Revive Our Hearts, and we'll send you both Facing Our Fears and 50 Promises to Live By. Now, to make a donation, just visit reviveourhearts.com or call us at 1-800-569-5959. That's 1-800-569-5959. And while you're there at our website... Be sure to take a look at our 30-Day Choosing Forgiveness Challenge. We're going to be doing it next month. It starts one week from today, but you can go ahead and get signed up right now. I wonder, do you want to grow? Or, or, Or maybe I should say it this way. Do you need to grow in the discipline of forgiving others the way God has forgiven you? Then this forgiveness challenge is for you. Again, you'll find the details in the transcript of today's program at reviveourhearts.com or when you call us at 1-800-569-5959. In Habakkuk's day, soldiers stood on a watchtower to keep their eyes open for an approaching enemy. Find out why a prophet climbed up one of those towers, and you should too. Nancy will talk about it tomorrow on Revive Our Hearts. Revive Our Hearts with Nancy DeMoss Walgamuth wants to help you move from fear to freedom, fullness, and fruitfulness in Christ.